Today is a continuance of what we call the Breaking Barriers Lecture Series. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing lecture series that we're going to feature every semester. Uh, we kicked it off uh, about two months ago with Dr. Jeff Duncan Andrade, and today we're concluding with uh, Cesar Cruz, who's going to be uh, concluding our lecture series for this semester. So be on the lookout for next semester. We're going to have a, a lot of motivation on great speakers coming up as well. Um, and just so you all are aware of the background of why Breaking Barriers Lecture Series started, it was really to provide us all, students, faculty, staff, with the toolkit to continue to for the struggle towards educational equity and social justice. This is what it's all about. And, uh, and that's why it really excites me to have Cesar come to us today, all the way from Harvard University. Um, today actually demonstrates to me how committed Cesar is to this. He, uh, he flew from Boston last night. I think he got in around 12 a.m. He's here today, and he's leaving back to Boston today, later on, like at four. So that just shows his commitment to do this work. Um, but moreover, you know, Cesar is somebody that I personally look up to a lot for his dedication for, for, for the struggle for equity and justice. Um, some of the, of the work that he's done, I can't read the entire list of what he's done, but some of the things that have been very inspirational includes uh, marching 76 miles, again, in the, in the name of equity and social justice going on a hunger strike for 26 days. Uh, he co-founded a, uh, a, a school called Making Changes. He uh, also co-founded a program called Homies Empowerment. Um, he's now at Harvard University completing his doctorate. Uh, and again, he's getting his doctorate to come back to our community to continue the work that he's been doing to, for, for so many years. Uh, so without further ado, let's give uh, Cesar Cruz a huge round of applause. What's in the air? What do you notice as part of the toxicity in the air? Since there's a good number of you, if you don't mind raising your hand, what's in the air that's creating this? Yeah. Unnecessary discrimination. What else is in the air? Negative imagery. What else is in the air? Some of the young people, what are some of the things that you saw? Yeah. And if you don't mind, project your voice, because I know you got a powerful voice. They made Mexican Americans seem like what? What sultry mean? You got them big words. You got them, them Harvard words. What, what's that mean? Sexy? I'm sexy now? Oh, thank you. Um, but I, I see what you're saying. Um, so, so sexualizing, especially some of the females, that's powerful. I saw a hand over here. Big time, yeah. ignorant. ignorant. And so I wanna, I wanna not disrespect any community in the house. Are there any Central Americans here? Raise it proud. Um, anybody from the Caribbean? Anybody from South America? What about African Americans? What about Asian Americans? What about Polynesians, Southeast Asians? Are there any Mexicans or Chicanos? Oh shit. <laughs> That's, this is why we got to create this border. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And so, I I want to I want to complexify I want to complexify what this idea of a border is because this border hasn't always existed. And those of you that are in the back, you might be a little bit more challenged because it's not a big screen. But I really want you to pay attention to some of these images. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to be hella boring and I don't want to waste your time. And sadly, we have to end by 1 o'clock, so I'm going to try to squeeze a lot of things in um, to be able to get to, to where we're trying to get to. Now, has anybody heard of this woman named Brene Brown? This gentleman has. Uh, Dr. Flaxman, soon to be Dr. Flaxman knows about her. Dr. Brene Brown says that stories might just be data with a soul. So if you give me permission, I'm going to share some personal stories that might just be data with a soul. Now. I want to take you to elementary school. Now, who hasn't been to elementary school in a long minute? <laughs> it's been a long minute. I, you know, I, I'm 41, and so it's a couple of days ago that I was in elementary school. Now, who is in middle school right now? OK, so it's been a few minutes. Is anybody in elementary school now? 
No. Who's in high school? Y'all are not proud. Who's in high school? Raise it kind of high. OK. Who's in college? All right, who's in the school of life? <laughs> Who doesn't know they're in the school of life and shit? Just in it. Um, so what I want to do is I want to ask you a favor. Is I want to take you to elementary school. And in order to do that, I got to take off this jacket. No, I'm not going to strip. Um, we're going to have a different kind of conversation. And uh, for those of you in the back, it might be kind of hard to see. But um, what I want to do is I brought all of my backpacks from Boston. And I want to share with you my very, very first one. This is, my, this is my backpack from elementary school. This is when I was cute and I was little. And I, I want you to go back to being five years old for a second. You're five. You're five. You're five. I was excited about school. Listen, I'm going to school. And they said they got like cool stuff and they got playtime and they got a play area and they got nap time and all this kind of other mess. And I'm excited. And I'm not in this country. I'm in another country called Mexico and I got to have my mochila azul. This is my blue backpack. And so little Cesar, you know, he thinks he's cute. He's going to school. He's getting ready. He's excited. And they're going to teach me these fancy things called vocabulary. Oh, snap. Words. Um, but they don't know that I'm already carrying some vocabulary. Can I share you some of the vocabulary that I've already learned? Are y'all awake? Yes. Um, so I hate opening this backpack. I'll tell you why in a minute. The first vocabulary word that I learned was bastard. I learned that and I was two. I learned that because that's what my mom says my father walked out on us. I don't remember my father. My last name is Cruz, and the only thing I have about that man is my last name, but he left us. The second word that I learned was migration because I was in Mexico at the time, and my mom said, me voy a ir al norte para una mejor oportunidad. I'm going to go to the north for a better opportunity, but I was like, I'm five. I don't really understand why my mom left, and one month passed, and two months passed, and three months passed, and one year passes, and two years passes, and all of a sudden, I'm growing up like without a mom, kind of, and without a dad for sure, and I'm wondering what's going on. Like maybe I'm not supposed to be loved. That's what it is. Because the people that gave birth to me, they bounced, is what I thought in my five-year-old head. And I became bilingual, y'all, so I'm proud of this. I became both perdido and lost. <laughs> Dang. Damn, bilingual with it. I was just lost and confused and estaba perdido and not really understanding what was going on. But I do want to fast forward. I'm nine years old. I got reunited with my moms. And that was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful day. Don't ask me how I got here. I'll tell you that after, after the talk. But I got here. I'm reunited with my mom. She remarried. I got a little sister. And I'm thinking everything's great, except one day mommy didn't come home. I was like, OK, maybe she's partying. I don't know. I'm nine now. I understand a little bit about parties. Two days happened. A week happened. All of a sudden, I found out that she got deported. And this is the first time that my mom got deported. And it became really scary to be nine years old coming home and being reunited with your moms and knowing that you may not know if you'll ever see your mom again. But I got good news. My mom came back. My mom came back and taught me some vocabulary words. And she began to teach me. And she taught me my place in society. It wasn't just the government or schools that told me stuff. My mom was, um, was conditioned to think a certain way. So she taught me this word. And she said to me, mijo, eres ilegal. You're illegal. And you kind of bow your head down. And you know your place. And your place is not Harvard. And your place is not speaking up. And your place is not standing up for your rights. You're a mojado. You're a wetback. And you got to know your place. The problem with Cesar is I'm a bad student. I'm a horrible student. I never learned how to be a perfect illegal. I never learned how to be a perfect wetback. But all of these words. All of these words I had in my first backpack. And I don't want you to feel sorry for me, and this isn't a competition of who's had it bad. Dr. Chavez, who's a, who's a doctor here in the Bay Area, she does a lot of phenomenal work. And Dr. Chavez talks about some of the things that we carry. Everybody had their first backpack. And this backpack is called your given reality. What was I born into? I was born into this backpack. But can we leave this backpack? Can we graduate? 
Somebody said, okay, can, come on, can we, can, we go to, can we go to middle school? Yes. So let me, let, me, let me go to middle school. Middle school is interesting. So middle school, my backpack is on fire. Anybody here like to burn, sh burn stuff? <laughs> watching you, I'm watching you. So I didn't grow up, I grew up in the, in the 70s and 80s, and so I didn't grow up with Alicia Keys. She has this song called, This Girl's on Fire. Now I'm not a girl and I'm not on fire, but I always felt like I was exploding on the inside. But I was told early on, boys don't cry. Men don't cry. Don't be a blah, blah, blah. So I did cry, but I cried in the closet and I cried in the bathroom. And I was exploding on the inside. What do they call that? What's the fancy word for exploding on the inside? Damn. You said internal combustion? I didn't have it that fancy. I went explosion, implosion. But it's the same idea. I was exploding and then I went to art class. Oh, our class was phenomenal. Anybody in here tag? Anybody in here do graffiti? Why, hey, Luis, watch them because they're going to tag up the campus. Where's Luis? <laughs> trucha, eh? Trucha. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful art form. Well, I wasn't a very good tagger. I wasn't a good graffiti artist, but I found myself something really amazing in art school. I found myself glue. This is not something I'm proud of. And for you kids in middle school, um, I just came back from speaking in, in the state of Utah, and I had a really difficult time in the state because when I did this, they called the police on me, and I'm, I'm being serious right now, and I had a really difficult time. I'm not advocating for this. I'm just explaining that a lot of young people are trying to figure out ways to go to sleep at night. It's called self-medication because they're stressed out, because they're dealing with a lot of drama at home. For me, my stepdad is acting a certain kind of way. My mom's been deported. I'm living in a neighborhood that's violent. I don't understand why I don't connect in school. I'm having a really hard time. And listen, I just want to go to sleep at night. And so I'm not condoning this. It's not as toxic as one would think. So I needed the toxicity level to be increased so that I could sleep at night. And these two artistic items became my best friend. They allowed me to sleep at night. I was no longer bullied. I was no longer harassed. I was no longer an illegal. I was no longer a wetback. I was no longer a waste of time. I was no longer uh, ignorant. <laughs> this was my form of self-medication. Then I had to graduate from that, so I went to Boone's Farm, and then I went to different types of alcohol, and then I went to weed, and then I went to pills, and I just kept having graduations because it was never enough. And now, did it ever bring my father back? Nah, but I, what, what a lot of adults didn't understand at that time is that I was in a lot of pain. And I was never a gangster, I was always a wannabe kid. And I grew up in a neighborhood where you had to choose a color. And what a lot of adults don't understand is that these colors are quite important. And in the Bay Area and in Oakland, you see these two colors a lot more. But all across the country, you see these two colors. You see Bloods and Crips, Norteños and Sureños. And what a lot of people don't know is these colors come from the US flag. And it's a way to divide and conquer. I didn't know that. And you have to be careful what color you choose because something happens at 6.01 PM. And so I was never in gangs. I was always this wannabe kid. And I grew up in a neighborhood where you had to choose one of these because at 6.01 PM, Every after school program has closed its doors. And there's very few community centers, so you need a sense of protection. And a lot of people don't understand that. And they don't understand that gangs, for some people, could be a second family, could be a sense of belonging, could be someone that has your back. And not everything about them is negative, except what we hear on the news is oftentimes negative. So a lot of kids oftentimes find themselves having to choose. The final piece is that I remember uh, when I came to this country hearing about pulgas and swap meets. Who, who, who understands pulga and swap meet culture? I try to explain this at Harvard and they're like, what, pulga? What's a pulga? So I, I, I'm a proud pulga and swap meet uh, connoisseur, if you will. See, I use my Harvard words. And uh, 
If a kid is born in 2015, I know all of you are freedom fighters and you're very elevated and you're all conscious and, and change agents, so I'm not talking about you. But if someone else, if a baby's born, what's the first question we ask about the baby before they're born? Boy or girl? We already want to separate them and we already want to do something to them. And then what colors do we choose to give them? Blue or pink? What if I want to wear my tutu and wear my pink on? What's wrong with that? You pay a price. What if a girl wants to wear blue and play sports and play tackle football? There's a price for that. It's early conditioning. Now, what's the number one toy we give little girls? Barbie. Barbie. What message are we sending to little Ketsali when we say, this is who we want you to be? And then for the boys, we give them toy guns. So when I was in middle school, I wanted to graduate from this. I was trying to get that BB. And then from that BB, I wanted to get that sawed off. And from that sawed off, I wanted to get a 22 and then an AK. I always wanted to graduate. And we never realized that we never go after Smith and Wesson, but we criminalize kids who have been fed this since birth. Now, can I graduate middle school? Is it cool if I leave middle school? Yeah. But before I do, some of the things that I was beginning to manifest, that I was beginning to show, by the time the end of middle school hit, I already knew I was illegal, I already knew I was a wetback, and I'm, I hate to say this, but I was not proud to be Mexican. And some of you are nodding your heads, and you know how painful that is, because I had already had enough schooling in the US to not want to speak Spanish, to not be proud of my mother and grandmother, to not bring them to school, and so all of a sudden, I became Caesar. Oh, shit, he thinks he's somebody. Um, I literally changed my name. So my high school ID card from Crenshaw High and Bell High School says Caesar. What in God's name is wrong with me? But before you judge me too hard for manifesting some of this, I want to talk about maybe some things that may have led to the creation of someone like a Caesar. What else is missing in someone like a Caesar? Damn, big word, stability. He said love, yeah. And I had no idea that when I came to this part of the US that I was kind of home. So I wanna talk about home through a different lens. Now, to get to my third backpack was this idea of I'm under construction and this idea of resiliency. If the first backpack was my given reality and my second backpack was how I was handling things or just coping, this third backpack is finding some resiliency. And when I began to open it, I began to see some books. Now, I used to hate to read. Keep it real. Who hates to read sometimes? Who, who hates to read sometimes? Damn. Keep them up for a second. Please, adults, don't judge them yet, even though some of the adults are raising their hands too. You're raising them a little too high, man. Um, in school, I never read a book like this. I never read a book about the Black Panther Party. And in school, I never learned about different Latino heroes. I had only heard about one dude, Cesar Chavez. He was the answer to everything. Like, who discovered America? Cesar Chavez. Who invented the light bulb? Cesar Chavez. Who's your daddy that ran away from you? Cesar Chavez. Damn. Damn. But, but I needed some heroes and some sheroes in my life. And when I began to find them, I started talking differently. Like, there's going to be a day in my life where I'm actually going to believe I'm good enough to graduate high school. There's going to be a day where I'm actually good enough to think that I can go to UC Berkeley and graduate undocumented with no papers. And there's going to be a day where I believe that I'm good enough to graduate from Harvard University with a doctorate from Harvard University. But that day hasn't come yet. That day hasn't come yet. I needed to learn some stuff. This is a real map, and it's a map of Mexico. Does anybody know what year this is? Damn, hey, maestro. 1848, correct. And that, that seems like hell a long ago because y'all think old school hip hop is stuff from like three years ago, right? So 1848 sounds hella far, but 1848 is two grandmothers ago. My grandmother's grandmother was here in this territory when it was called California, when it was Mexico. And if and then their generation were here when it was Native American land, and before that when it wasn't anybody's land. But if you notice, 
You've got California, Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, Texas, all of part of Mexico. And it's important that we look at some quick numbers. And I know it's kind of hard to see, but in the 18, from 1815 to 1820, there were already hundreds of thousands of quote unquote Mexicano US side, if you will, before there was a US side here. So for anybody to tell us that we just arrived is some criminal stuff. Now, I want to share with you one quick thing. There was a war between the US and Mexico that led to the US taking over Arizona, Texas, Oregon, Nevada, California. But they wrote a treaty, and in Article 10 of that treaty, at the top it says that if you're a Mexican citizen and you own land, your, your rights are to be respected. And that's important. It says all grants of land made by the Mexican government or by the competent authorities in territories previously appertaining to Mexico and remaining for the future within the limits of the US shall be respected as valid to the same extent that the same grant would be valid to the same territories had remained within the limits of Mexico. That's just fancy talk that Mexicanos who were here, like Don Peralta, who the Peralta colleges are named after, like Cesar Vallejo, who the town of B-Town is named after, or Pio Pico down in Los Angeles, that land was supposed to be respected. But two grandmothers later were wetbacks in our own land. Something has taken place. But see, a lot of people fought back. This is a revolutionary who I wish I would have learned about coming up in school. She's part Native American, part African American, and part Mexicana. She's kind of the first Chicana. And it is because of her that we have the 40-hour workday. Her name is Lucy Gonzalez Parsons. And here is what Chicago PD used to say about her. She was more dangerous than a thousand rioters because she was organizing her people and she was fighting back for her rights. So they banned her from the city of Chicago. So what did she do? She rented a boat and she rode a boat to Navy Pier by the water in the bay in Chicago. And she spoke to 10,000 people and the cops couldn't arrest her because she, she wasn't in Chicago. And she organized something in US history called the Haymarket Affair so that now we have a 40 hour work week and you have a woman to thank for. You have a Native American, an African American, and a Chicana woman to thank for that unfortunately we don't study about in US history. Now she's not the only one. And this isn't a Mexican story. And this isn't even a Latino story. But these are women that we don't necessarily grow up learning about that's important for our history. At the turn of the century, in 1900, you start to see a lot of generations of Mexicans already here. Uh, the, the pointer isn't working, but if you notice, this is the percentage of Mexicans living in the US that were not born in the US. And always the numbers were low, except for 1920. What was happening in 1920? Somebody tell me. Before the Depression, World War I just ended, and the Mexican Revolution is going on. So it was the first time where you had more Mexicans coming in from Mexico in the only time that's ever happened in history, in 1920. Now, I want you to take a look at this image, and I, I, I hate showing this image because it, it, it bothers me. Because you had an environmental movement, and I'm all for environmental rights, while African Americans were being hung on trees. These, 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 uh, these citizens called the Texas Rangers started doing what's called dry hangings. In a period of five years, they hung 5,000 Mexican Americans. And what they did is they would wrap a rope around their neck and drag them till the neck snapped. This was their symbol. And we turned their history into a baseball team. We honor the legacy of the lynching of the Mexican-American community by naming a baseball team after them. We would never imagine naming a team the Louisiana KKK. There would be an outrage. And this is not about divide and conquer, but because we don't know Mexican-American history and we don't have allies that take up our cause, we have the Bush family who owns the Texas Rangers and who say that the legacy they live out is the lynching of Mexican-American people. All of a sudden, during the Great Depression, you start seeing signs by the Chambers of Commerce saying, Mexicans keep going. We can't even take care of our own. And then you have 
uh, trains, it's hard to see trains that show up to Oakland, California, to Los Angeles, California, and thousands upon thousands of U.S. citizens get rounded up and get deported to a country they've never been to. 1.5 million citizens were kicked out of the country. If this had happened to someone else, it'd be a national outrage. But because it happened to the Mexican-American community, it's history we don't learn much about. Now, I do want to, I do want to tell you about a phenomenal organization that Howard Zinn started. And it's a website called the Zinn Education Project. They made a documentary about these kids who in the 1930s desegregated U.S. schools. You could watch a free documentary online. It's called The Lemon Grove Incident. And it's about Mexican-American families desegregating schools in the 1930s. Imagine if they had taught us that, I would actually feel like I belong in U.S. schools. In the 1940s, you had something called the Bracero Program. And Bracero is the Spanish word for brazos. What started to happen is they wanted Mexicans here as cheap labor, but they didn't want the whole body. They just wanted the brazos. And they, they were so desperate for our labor that here's a newspaper article. They went so far as to go to the capital of Mexico City to bring 125,000 Mexicans to come work in U.S. fields to build agribusiness. So the reason that this country is so strong is on the backs of Chinese labor, of African labor, of Asian labor, of Latino labor. And it's important that that get recognized. These are the numbers of Mexicans that were brought in. But at the same time, they created for the first time the word wetback in U.S. government law. They're bringing them in, and then they're kicking them out with Operation Wetback. And these are the number of people that are being deported. We want you to get the hell out. We want you to get the hell out. So this is not a new story that we hear in 2015. So many contradictory messages. This is a real poster that the US government put out in the 1940s. It was the first time they called us Americans. And they called us Americans because they wanted us to go to war and fight for this country. They said, Americans all, and they put a sombrero next to Uncle Sam's top hat. And a lot of people answered the call. What is this powerful image? Rosie the Riveter. But in our US history class, Rosie was never Rosita. We weren't just in the fields. Rosita and many women were out in the railroads these are all Latina and Mexican-American women answering the call, not just quote unquote as domestics, working to build the empire that is the United States, but not getting the historical recognition. These are some of the people that answered the call during World War II, over 500,000 enlisted. The most congressional medals of honor in the history of the United States were granted to the Mexican-American community. The first medal of honor by Harry Truman went to a quote-unquote undocumented soldier. For generations, we've been paying with our service and our blood to be here, but we're still the illegal alien wetbacks of society begging and taking people's jobs. It wasn't just men answering the call. When you think about military soldiers, do you think of military women? Do you think of Mexicana women? These are Mexicana and Chicana and Latina women answering the call. Now, has anybody ever heard of this famous case? This is the reason we were able to pass Brown versus Board of Education. So when you think about Latino kids, I want you to think about Latino kids who desegregated US schools so that we could all have an opportunity to go to school. Take a look at this. California has always been on the forefront of social change. But few people know that California led the way to school desegregation seven years before the historic Brown versus the Board of Education ruling. California Assemblymember Mary Salas wants people to know about the 1947 U.S. Court of Appeals decision in the case of Mendez versus Westminster, a case that involved the Mexican-American family, the Mendez family, whose children were denied entry into a public school in Orange County. Mr. Mendez then leased the property from this Japanese farmer uh, to raise crops. And when he did that, then, then uh, his, he tried to enroll his children in school. And the children were turned around and they were told that they needed to go to the Mexican school that was further away. And it was very common at the time that schools in California were segregated. 
School segregation was not the only racial injustice in California at the time. This happened during World War II, a time when Japanese Americans were being rounded up and placed in internment camps. The farm the Mendez family was leasing belonged to a Japanese family who were forced off their land. So it was an injustice that was borne by a Japanese American family that was forced to go to an internment camp that led to the injustice that the Mendez family suffered when they tried to enroll their children in the school. Salas believes it's vital that we not forget this part of our history. That's why she's authored Assembly Bill 531. The bill would require that the Mendez decision be taught in California. Students, how many of you have been taught that in California? It never passed. It's like it never happened. It's like it never happened. It's like 10,000, excuse me, let me get my numbers correct. They got 5,000 Mexican kids and 10,000 total families to put their name suing the city of Westminster, California and winning a powerful case. And I hope, I hope that I'm not presenting this in a way where it's so Mexican centric that you're like, I can't relate to this. That's not the goal. The goal is to talk about kids that are coming from places like Mexico who feel like they don't belong, who aren't being taught their history. Does that make sense? Um, now, in the 1960s, you begin to see a blowout of students who are demanding their education. Over 30,000 students walked out throughout schools in the Southwest and they wanted bilingual education bicultural education, they wanted Chicano Latino studies, ethnic studies, they wanted to no longer be hit for speaking Spanish in school. Kids were beaten for speaking Spanish in school. She was telling me about some of the psychological trauma that her friends were facing. And when you get the Mexican beaten out of you, like we've gotten a lot of people's roots beaten out of them, um, it creates what's called generational trauma. And so I, what I want you to show you what young people were doing to fight back. And so I found some footage um, early this morning. I want you to make sure. Although they say they strongly encourage pupils to speak English, they also deny charges that Mexican American students have been. Um, what this video is, is 10,000 students fighting for their rights, and you begin to hear young Latinas on the news saying, ya basta, we're gonna fight back. I want you to take a look at this. What is the attitude of the administration toward Mexican Americans? Um, well, they, uh, on my opinion, they have always been pushing us and I think it's time for us not to be pushed around so much like they have. They want you to say, well, I regret what I've done, and uh, I won't do it again. Uh, they want you to do that in order to get back into school. Will you do that? No, I won't. Why? Because, uh, well, I don't, I don't feel time for what I did. I think it's right. The school dispute exemplifies the new spirit pervading Mexican-Americans who live along this river. Mexican-Americans here hope their new spirit will bring a better life to them. Ed Raymond, CBS News, and the Rio Grande Valley. That was in 1968. How many of you, before I play this, honestly sometimes feel like F school, because school don't give a ish about me? Keep it real. So, can I kick it next to you? So, why did you raise your hand and be like, F school, and school don't really give a shit about me? Why, why, why do you say that? And talk to them. Yeah. Um, and and uh, do you ever get to learn stuff like this at your school? No? If you got to learn stuff like this at the school, would it still be hella boring? Maybe lightweight? Damn, we gotta work a little harder, okay. Um, now, you and me, you and me were not dumbasses. I'm staring at a young genius. I'm staring at a young warrior right now. But the plan is, nobody wants you to go to college, and I'm gonna keep it real wide. Because if California wanted, to go, wanted you to go to college, homie, they wouldn't have built 23 new prisons. They built 23 new prisons and only one new college, as you see said, in the last 30 plus years. 
So if you hate school and you quote unquote drop out and be like, this is hella boring, I don't know about this history, their plan is working. And I want you to hear what he says because he says that for a long time they've all they've wanted us for is to be worker bees. And there's nothing wrong with working, y'all, but we're gonna work till we die. We're gonna work till we die. We've been working to build this country for a long time. Take a look at what he says. Let me make sure I get it right. When asked about the most prominent injustices he faced going to school in the late 60s as a young Chicano, as far as I recall, there was the obvious social injustice of living in the country as Chicanos and Mexicanos, all being programmed to become laborers. None of us were being programmed to enter college. There was a realization that the dropout rate was not our own failure, but that of the system, which pre-programmed us. The failure on our part was we bought into it and we accepted that was all we could do. Chicano youths felt that their tailored education system was confining them to a life as laborers, a position that many generations of Chicanos before them had filled. These youths realized that their chances for social mobility were minimal considering they were withheld a proper education that would avail them social advancement in higher education. So, rather than stay in school, they dropped out and accepted the jobs for which they had been programmed. However, with the surge of anger at their dismal academic conditions came the realization that their failure was not the problem, but rather the system that was setting them up for failure. Chicano students no longer allowed the status quo of the population to claim that they were doing the best they could for a population that really didn't have what it took to succeed, but forced them to look at the blatant faults within their own educational system. These faults are highlighted in the list of demands proposed by the students to the East Los Angeles School Board. These demands were to be presented to the Los Angeles Board of Education with the expectation that school officials would immediately respond and agree to their petition. The demands were a representation of the injustices and mistreatment that the students tolerated within their high schools. The proposed demands revealed the lack of resources and attention provided to Chicanos by the school officials. A general trend of the demands was the need to be culturally recognized as Mexican American and the necessity to eliminate discrimination by school officials. One of the demands included a direct request for bilingual education. Bilingual bicultural education will be compulsory for Mexican Americans in the Los Angeles City school system where there is a majority of Mexican American students. This demand demonstrated the students' desires to have a learning environment that was culturally and linguistically relevant to their lives. Among other demands, Students asked for the inclusion of a curricula that would relate to their cultural experiences. Steve. They, they demanded this in 1968. They got the beginnings of this in 2014. With Los Angeles Unified School District saying that for the first time they're going to have ethnic studies to learn African American, Native American, Asian American, and Chicano Latino history as a graduation requirement. Why does it take from 1968 to 2014 for LA or San Francisco to get it together? And what's happening to all the other schools that aren't teaching us our history? I had no idea that what the young man said has a name to it. That name is called subtractive schooling. Here's a doctora, doctora Angela Valenzuela, who studied Latino students in US schools. And, and her idea was that the more years that students go to U.S. schools, the more gets subtracted from them. They don't want to speak Spanish. They're not proud of being raza. They're not proud of their culture. They're not proud of their roots. And that gets taught and reinforced in schools. She theorizes that school is bad for your health. Holy smokes. Now, it would be unjust of me to not argue for education. Education is very different from schooling. I've never met a young person who doesn't want to learn some stuff, but I've met a lot of kids who hate being schooled, who hate being bruised by school, who hate being made to feel like they're a dumbass. There isn't a dumbass in the room. But I want to ask you, how many of you at some point in school have been made to feel like you are not smart? 
We got to unlearn that and we got to heal from that because how in God's name are we going to navigate Harvard University if we feel like dumbasses? If the only thing that we're good for is to clean the building and I have no problem cleaning Harvard University, but shit, I'm teaching at Harvard University right now. <laughs> this isn't about me though. You came for a reason. This is about you. This is about your future. This is about your opportunity to fight for social justice, but sometimes we have to unpack some stuff. So the last thing that I want to unpack, I've made a one minute video for Harvard trying to explain to them what my school was like and they couldn't take it. They're like, this is too much. See if you could relate. This is my story, but not just my own. I came to the US speaking very little English but got messages from family that school was extremely important. I took it seriously, quickly learned the language, but it came with damaging lessons to my own self-esteem. See, white were the founding fathers. Whites discovered and freed me. Whites are the scientists, the mathematicians. They are to be my role models. Whites are the leading characters in every story we read in school. White is the color of peace. If white is right, what is brown and black? There are no mirrors in my schools or my textbooks. This is not a series of anecdotes, but rather what Dr. Valenzuela calls subtractive schooling. It happens daily to millions. It damages souls, creates inferiority complexes, produces mass dropouts. For America's sake, please just stop. And when I shared this at Harvard, they had a hard time understanding that because they felt offended. And my goal wasn't to offend anybody. It's not to offend you. It's to talk about the price that people pay to be schooled in the United States. If you, if you suffered through some of this, would you raise your hand? If you felt an element of being schooled. So this isn't my voice. And I saw some white hands go up. And when I met white students in the South, and I thought this was white history, I met white poor kids who said to me, they're not teaching me Irish history. They're not teaching me about my roots. You know what they call poor white people in America? They call them trailer trash. We have no respect for human beings in the United States. If you happen to not have money in your pocket and you're white, they call you trailer trash. So imagine what we call everybody else. This is not a brown issue. This is not a white issue. And we have to do something about it. And school doesn't have to be hella boring. I want to take you to a phenomenal state. I want to take you to Arizona. And this is what education looks like in Arizona. I had a teacher that would tell me, like, oh, you're not going to go to college. The way things were going, I probably just would have just left school. I'm not going to lie, I hated education. Everybody knew that the school system was discriminatory. It was an urgency for us to make a state. We're going to push the envelope a little further. Good morning, you're looking for M215? That's my class, I'm Mr. Plus, what's your name? It was really about how can we turn this around. How do we fix societal problems in our school? This class is based on critical thinking, and in that does come empowerment. I actually know my history now. I started getting A's and B's. Our students are graduating at a much higher rate, and our kids are going to college at a much higher rate. What's being done down here in Tucson Unified School District is teaching them hate speech, sedition. I'm calling on the school district to shut down the ethnic studies program. Yeah. The yeah. program is administered by vehemently anti-American zealots. It doesn't teach us to be anti-American. It teaches us to embrace America. This is what is beautiful to all of us. No matter how far this bill goes, we're here together in the loot chat. We believe it's a matter of life and death. When they try to take these classes away, it's something impossible. The idea that race is no longer an issue, but we're saying it's BS. You want different culture, go back to that culture. But this is America. You get away from my border! It's about the freedom to ask the questions that are the most pertinent in the way they view the world. When you have students demonstrating wearing brown shirts, bandanas, this is serious. See, education doesn't have to be hella boring. Uh, one, of my, one of my very young elders just showed up, and I referenced this book. Um, and this book, 
And this history had a tremendous impact on my life. And so one of my young elders, her name is Tarika Lewis, she's in the back, and I'm gonna embarrass her a little bit. Tarika Lewis, oh, hold your applause till I'm done with, hold on, hold on. There's a lot to applaud her for. Tarika Lewis has been fighting for our education for a long, long time. She was the first woman to join the Black Panther Party here in Oakland, California. She's a trained concert violinist. She's been teaching for a long time. She also, I don't know how, convinced Hollywood to make a film about the Black Panther Party. And this is a book that she co-wrote. And it was one of the first times in the history of Hollywood cinema that they talked about the relationship between Oakland Police Department, the FBI, and drug dealers to flood the communities, black and brown communities, with cocaine to destroy us. And Tarika Lewis had the courage to make sure that films like that were produced. That film is called Panther. She's one of my elders. Can we please give Tarika Lewis a hand? And that leads me to getting to my fourth backpack because when I realized I had a different sort of history, I began to open up a fourth backpack that I hope you're opening up or one day will open up. This backpack is called your life's calling. What are you called here to do? And sometimes the problems of life seem so big. We've got so many bills to pay. We got drama at home. We got drama in the neighborhood. Nobody believes in us. Sometimes I don't believe in myself. The love isn't at home and it isn't inside of me. And so what I started doing is I started going to some ancient history and I started studying the Toltecs. This is called the Fifth Agreement by a man named Don Ruiz who wrote a book called The Four Agreements. And I began to learn my history a different way and all of this all of this is part of my history, and I began to look at things a little different. I used to see my life as a cup that was always half empty. I began to see my life as a cup that is half full, and yes, my dad bounced. Yes, he, yes, yes, he bounced when I was two, but one of the things that was really important is I began to appreciate my father. My father committed suicide when I was 21. And the best thing my father could do was leave us because he was going to kill my mother and he was going to kill me. And I don't know why he left. And I don't know why he committed suicide. And I don't know where in this universe he's at. But Father, Pops, I forgive you. I forgive you because I can't carry the anger and the hatred in my heart because it's eating at me. I can't trust men. I can't trust society. And I've got to be able to forgive. And th these I call hidden gifts. They're hidden gifts that I started getting when I started seeing things through a different light. My mother migrating was important in my life because I didn't want to be separated. But when a, when a tree has deep, deep roots and the tree knows who the tree is, it's hard to chop. And I got chopped in the US, but they chopped the top part. They didn't know I was deeply rooted in my cultural history. And listen, when I found my voice, now, I don't know the new lingo in the town because I've been away from the town for two years. But two, two, three years ago, we used to say that if we won, it's cookies. And what that means is, is this, if you know who you are, young man, if you're proud of who you are, young women, if you know you've been called to change the world, who's going to stop you? And when I began to find my roots and realize that I'm deeply rooted, it began to fill my spirit in a different way. When my mother got deported, it was easy to become resilient really quickly because at nine years old, you got to learn how to dodge immigration and you got to learn how to dodge bullets and you got to learn how to take care of yourself. And I was very lucky and blessed to also have a phenomenal grandmother in my life who helped me through that process, but not everybody does. The, the, the process, this idea of losing, of losing myself when you find yourself, when you find your voice, I used to be the quiet kid in the back of class. I used to be the faded kid. I used to be the kid that was hella drunk. And now I'm the loud kid. Now I'm the kid at Harvard who will not be quiet, who will not be silent, who is here to fight for social justice, who understands my calling and my place in society because I stand on the legacy of the Black Panther Party and the Brown Berets and the Young Lords and freedom fighters that have been fighting for a long time to change the world. I'm not even going to address that, but there's nothing illegal in me. What, what I had to go through was a process of understanding my history, 
of beginning to see my life through a different lens. And these are some of the things. This is Chinese ancient philosophy called the I Ching that I began to study to understand my life through a different lens. And if I'm ever allowed to come back, where's Luis? Is he back? I'm trying to beg Luis. After Harvard, the next institution I want to come to is the College of Alameda. <laughs> Or, or and Lainey, or and Merrick. And, 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 and I'm hoping that Luis will help us set up a Homies Empowerment Institute and a new kind of pipeline so that we end the, the school to prison pipeline and we do a different kind of pipeline. So we're going to talk about that right after this with Luis. Is the president here of, of, of College of Alameda? Oh, snap, I just gave away my speech. <laughs> Don't hold it against me. I've got Tarika Lewis on my side. <laughs> Don't say no. Um, this is what we're dealing with, though. This is not a pipeline. This is a funnel. And what's still happening today is you have 100 Mexican-American students that are starting school at the same time. By the time high school graduation hits, only 46 of those kids will graduate. What happened to 54 of them? They're not dumbasses. They're young geniuses, and something took place. But you go from 46 so only 26 of those will enroll either at the College of Alameda or at another college. So 17 of those will come to the College of Alameda, nine of those will come to a four-year college. Do not devalue this place. Do not overvalue Harvard. Anywhere you have freedom fighter educators and people willing to stand up for education is a valuable place. Who, who has an opening question they'd like to ask us? Dr. Brown. <laughs> um, I was wondering how you went to Harvard and how you were able to maintain the sense of self and self and self and self. It's more like it's institutional change you than you are taking the institution. How did you kind of make the same set talk from 10 years ago? I don't know, brother. Um, the, the, it's, it's a longer conversation, but um, how many of you have gone to schools where you're like, you're like the only one? So I'm not teaching you nothing new. And nothing I've gone through, my ancestors haven't gone through. They've gone through tenfold. So I reminded myself that every day as I walk to school, um, I walk to school with certain music to prepare me for the day. And I walked home in tears every day. There wasn't a lot of days at Harvard where I wasn't in tears. And they have these things when people are racist towards you, they have this fancy language called microaggressions. And so I remember one day, I'm going to tell you just one story, and it was a trifecta. I mean, I don't know how this happened. This was November, it starts to get cold in Boston. And I didn't have a, this is the same, like, if I gain any more weight, I am not going to afford another damn jacket. So part of it was eating, too, so I got I to work on that. But um, that I didn't have a winter coat. And there was a thrift store, and I found a beautiful winter coat for five bucks. So I'm juiced. And I left it under my desk. And I forgot about it. I left. I came back, and I was like, I need to find my jacket. So I came back, and I'm under the table. And, and you know, I, I look the way I look, you know? And so I'm under the table getting stuff, and a really nice grad student shows up. And she's like, oh, I'm really sorry. I didn't know you were cleaning the place. No problem with that. No problem with that. And I was just like... I want to tell you that I said some really eloquent shit. I didn't. I froze. And I became apologetic. I froze and I was just like, oh, I'm sorry. I was just looking for something and I bounced. So then I go across the street to the local um, cafe to buy a cup of coffee. Uh, this is at the, at the Graduate School of Education. And, and this really nice gentleman lets me cut in line. I'm like, no, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. And, and then the way it kind of looks, it's like it looked like I was going to maybe go into work there. So he's like, no, I thought you worked here. So I was like, what the hell's on my forehead, right? I got Baisa written all over it or something, right? Nothing wrong with Baisa, I'm Baisa, I'm proud. So I get my cup of coffee, and then I said, I'm going to splurge. I'm going to splurge. I can't afford a $50 fancy-ass Harvard jacket, but I'm going to splurge. I don't know how. I go to the Harvard store. They had, they had for 25% off, they had jackets. So I go to buy the thing, and they don't believe that my ID is my ID. They got to call the manager to give me the discount. So I'm walking home with this nice Harvard jacket with an H on it, like a dumbass branded myself like if I'm a cow. 
And I'm walking home, and as soon, you know Jazzy, she's gonna play. So I walk in the door, and my wife Jazzy's like, she sees my heart, I never wear the logo of nobody. She sees the jacket, and she said, you sold out already? So, so I just started crying. She's like, what's wrong? So I told her the day, and it's like I had to realize that my role wasn't to fit in. People are going to judge you regardless. How do you navigate that? How do you not let them break your spirit? How do you not let them put you in your place? How do I not assume that everybody's racist and maybe they're just ignorant or maybe they just had a, a simple confusion? When do I fight? When do I not? How do I fight for change? How do I fight for ethnic studies at Harvard that's never had ethnic studies? And I had to learn all these things in quick, quick time. So I went online and I found something called racial battle fatigue. And then the only African-American male in our cohort, he talked to me about the black tax. That every day he goes to school, he pays a black tax for being the only black man in our entire cohort and all the stuff he's got to deal with. And then I started thinking about our ancestors. I mean, we're talking Frederick Douglass, we're talking Booker T, we're talking so many people that have paid way much more than we have. If they made it, what do I got to complain about? I'm a privileged human being. It's, and so it was beginning to find my voice in that space, and that's a long, long answer, but it involved a lot of tears, a lot of like feeling like I don't belong here. Um, I also did double the readings. The, so they assigned 300 pages a week. I did that, and then I called my homie G, or I called my homie Jeff, or other folks, and I was like, I need other readings to counter these readings, because these readings are super boo-boo, and I need to bring up counter narratives. So I showed up, I was the most prepared student because you were not gonna outwork me. You were not kicking me out of Harvard. Not, not because I wasn't prepared. And so I've gotten straight A's ever since. So we're doing all right. Oh. Any more questions? Anybody else? And be careful what you ask, because I got long ass answers. <laughs> Romeo, Dr. G. So with all the struggles that you continue to go through, what has been uh, your biggest area of growth in this experience of being hard. So, so even though Katia says I'm the same person from 10 years ago, except a little wider, um, is um, I'm working with someone from West Point Military Academy at the business school. And it was because of Laura. Laura told me about this professor named Scott Snook. And I'm now working with people who don't think anything like me, who come from a very different experience, and they're just human beings too. And then I'm realizing that I went there as a lone wolf, and I'm coming back as someone who wants to build community. So I want to come back and listen to, to Homeboy Industries, listen to the Bay, see where I could add my tiny grain of sand, but with a, a lot of people's grain of sand. Mm -hmm.